Life in Elizabethan England then blends into topic three, and this video I will place at the end of Elizabethan life, or sorry, say topic two, but it's going to be relevant to the information used in topic three, troubles at home and abroad. See that key word, abroad. See, the voyages and ships and travel by sea became one of the most important parts of Elizabethan England's life. One, clearly because England's an island and pretty much that's the only way you can get stuff to and from England is by the sea. But during Elizabeth's lifetime, there was a renewed interest and a renewed age of sea travel. And we need to actually understand what that is and why it might be important to understand the whole period of Elizabethan England. We study this through three different people, and I'm going to try and talk about the three, which we say, ideas they present, as well as their three, well, successes. The picture behind me, you might remember that this is a picture of Sir Francis Drake. Sir Francis Drake is really famous for exploration. He was a privateer as well. He was known as El Drac by the Spanish because he stole so much gold from them. But in particular, he was one of these, should we say, explorers because Francis Drake went out to go and raid the Spanish and just kind of kept raiding Spanish ships over and over and over and over again until essentially he accidentally, genuinely didn't mean to, circumnavigated the world, which means he went around the world for the very first time. Now, when I tell people that, people often come to me going, who cares? Like, he's not made any money doing that. He's not, you know, got on a, wow, he's got a world record, you know, like, what's the point in doing that? But actually, with the news of Sir Francis Drake circumnavigating, it revealed that the world was travelable. It revealed the scope of where you could go and how you could get there. And it revealed, essentially, to Elizabeth and many other monarchs at the time that there was a way to make money out of it. There was a way to make power out of it. Now, before we get into those parts, we need to understand what allowed Drake to circumnavigate the world. And actually, there is a thing that does it. And it's very useful for your migration topic as well. It is new technology. There was new stuff being done to ships at Elizabeth's at the time of reign that meant that ships could physically travel around the world because before Elizabeth's reign, it actually was not possible. So, for example, ships were built of a higher quality. These large galleons, they're called these gigantic ships with huge, huge sails are a major reason why they can travel as far. They can take a beating. They can carry more people. They can be repaired quite effectively. Those higher quality means that the ship's going to last and travel across the sea. Um, as well as that, communications with China have allowed people to access a different kind of sail. These are called lante or lanteen sails. You see these triangle ones. They are safer to use, easier to use and faster to steer. That means ships can go further and get further away from Britain to travel and essentially get there faster so you don't have as much food necessary. Going faster means you're going to get to places better. On top of that, the ships are high quality, the ships are strong, they can carry heavier weapons. You can protect yourself. So cannons were able to be installed on ships to protect themselves. These ships are now not just, you know, isolated in the sea, but they are actually able to make it to areas that they might see as dangerous. And this other one is a hard one to describe because I don't want to explain to you how an astrolabe works, but the astrolabe was a way of navigating north and south via stars, which then helped sailors to know exactly where they are, which means they can get to places more accurately, which means they are not going to be stuck lost for months at a time. See, even with these new developments, Drake's circumnavigation was still a problem. Uh, he travelled with, he went off with five ships and only returned with a single ship. Like, the whole trip was a disaster and it was a failure in a lot of ways. But that moment, that ability to change, brought wealth, influence and respect for Britain. It brought Britain to the height of sea travel, which meant the next two ages could happen. See, the next thing was this age of trade. See, going around the world on a ship doesn't really matter, but if all of your ships can travel all the way around the world, the stuff that they carry is going to be quite important, especially if you know the shape of the world, you know where stuff you can buy and sell is. See, most trade in Europe was, should we say, with Europe, frankly. Why would you trade and spend loads of money to get someone to buy stuff from miles away and bring it back really slowly when you could just get the immediate things you needed? You could get bread from France and you could get, should we say, gold from Norway and things like this. These 
basic amenities, they're called, you could get on your own. But with the age of sea travel, this new age of trade, it was easier to get more exotic items and more exotic items can be sold for more money. So Elizabeth began to promote these sorts of companies to go out and begin to trade with these, should we say, further away groups of people. We know already about the East India Company that was set up by Elizabeth to start sorry, sorry, to have a monopoly on trade with India. But there were other groups like the Muscovy Company with Moscow, the Eastland Company with Scandinavia, and even um, there was one dedicated to Turkey that slips my mind. But multiple different groups of companies were trying to, should we say, monopolize and trade to make Britain rich. And then on top of that, there is one person who annoyingly is not on my screen, but John Hawkins. John Hawkins is the name of someone he's actually referenced in Migration 2. He is an example of Britain's first slave trader. He goes and begins, should we say, starts to slave, well, enslave and then transport and sell uh, human beings to people in the Americas to use on plantations. John Hawkins sets up the beginnings of the slave trade that Britain happily engages with. And if you've done your migration, you'll know exactly what they're doing with it. But Britain begins to make money out of sea travel. The voyages are connected. On top of that, um, we have, an, should we say, a re relation about the new world. And again, we're talking about this in, well, we talked about this in migration, but the discovery of the Americas, these bits are behind me, the discovery of these bits of land that no one knew existed at the time, should we say, revealed the opportunity that you could build colonies, the expansion of power. And the name of the guy who does our, should we say, first colonising is a man called Sir Walter Raleigh. He sets up the English first colony of Roanoke, which does not succeed. Don't worry about the reasons why. But Sir Walter Raleigh has a very good example of somebody specific that goes out to try and start colonising. And you know that these are called, should we say, the beginnings of that British Empire that you've studied before. These three groups of people, so it's Francis Drake, uh, John Hawkins and Sir Walter Raleigh, all bring new wealth, influence, and should we say money? Wealth, influence, and power, sorry, to Britain. And if you can remember who they are, what they did, how they did it, with specific examples, you'll be able to definitely prove you know why voyages were important. Thanks for listening. I'll see you later.